Okay, the truth about Jesus. You probably were shocked when you opened your eyes and saw these two photos, or these two paintings or pictures. And uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit today. The painting on the left is one that we're all familiar with. It was in my home as I was as I grew up by Warner Solman. He was an artist. And the picture on the right is it was done by a medical artist, Richard Neve. I think you pronounce it. He's a British medical artist. And the picture on the left, the painting on the left, is based on um, nothing. It's based on no archaeological evidence, no description, uh, no evidence whatsoever that Jesus looked like this. The one on the right is taken from three skulls that were unearthed um, in the area where Jesus was raised. And the skulls are roughly somewhere in their 30s, about the age he was when he died. And so this medical artist put those together, created a composite, and came up with a, an image of what Jesus probably looked like. And when I first saw this, it, it was a shocker because he looks more like a Neanderthal <laughs> caveman. But what was the most interesting about it was, could I live with a Jesus like this? I had to think of for myself, you know, in, in myself. And I had to do a lot of readjusting. Is, that, is it possible that um, I could make that transition? So it's the one on the left is like a European hippie. You know, we if if this man on the left were sitting in a crowd of Jews of his day, of people of his day, he would have stood out like a sore thumb. He would have looked very odd. The one on the right would have fit right in. And the medical artist said one of the there's a couple of reasons he came up with things like hair length and uh, just overall appearance. Uh, there was one case where the Roman soldiers showed up, you know, at a, um, a campsite and asked some of the disciples who Jesus was, where he was, which meant that he was not anything like the guy on the left. He would have stood out. They would have been able to point him out or the, you know, nobody would have had to ask. But he blended in. So they had to find out who he was. And the other bit of evidence he went on was uh, the fact that Paul said it was a sin for a man to have long hair. <laughs> we don't have any descriptions of Jesus. There's no, there are no descriptions whatsoever anywhere. And so what we think of as Jesus, this picture we think of as Jesus, is someone's imagination. Someone came up with it. It's a pleasant picture, and it goes along with, you know, our Sunday school training and all that stuff we came through. But what we're looking at here is a complete contradiction. Uh, one is what we want him to look like, I guess, and the other is closer to probably what he looked like. It's kind of interesting, a couple of the critics of the photo on the right the drawing on the right say that um, you know that he wouldn't necessarily look like this, but they agree that it's probably closer to what he did look like than the one on the left. And why would that matter? It matters because the teachings of Jesus are exactly the same. In the Gospels, were presented with teachings of Jesus that would look like the photo on the left or the picture on the left. They're idealized. Uh, they're presented in a way that is taken out of context. And some of the scholars that are uh, investigating what Jesus really taught, how do we discern, or they're looking for ways to discern 
what was authentic that he taught in the Gospels and what was product of the early church. Remember, we have Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Have nothing according to Jesus. We have pictures, renditions of Jesus according to whatever artists are doing the painting. But we have no photos of Jesus. We have no representations of Jesus. So we live with this idealized version, both physically and teaching-wise. And we try to live up to the teachings of Jesus that we've been presented. They're actually the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't really know what Jesus taught, and I have done sort of what the uh, medical artist has done myself and look for the bare bones of what would a mystic teach? Where do we find evidence of a mystical teaching, an inner oriented teaching in the words attributed to Jesus? And there are a number of places, a number of gems that stand out. And that's been kind of my focus on what Jesus has taught. There are several parables, several sayings that, from my perspective, would have come from someone who understood what it is to be a spiritual being going through a human experience. But we have this, this portrait of Jesus that is the Son of God, this one and only Son of God that came down to save all of us from our sins if we accept Him as our Savior and uh, all of that stuff. So we have this idealized what Jesus represented. But I don't think Jesus would have said that. I don't think Jesus would have come from that same perspective. I think he would have done everything he could, in fact, to denounce it. And I know that's blasphemous or uh, heretical in the ears and eyes of some, but it's okay. It's the same with the Buddha. You know, nothing was written about the Buddha for 500 years after his death. That's a long time. All we have about him, including the images, are fantasy. They're stories that were passed down. And some of them probably are based in fact, and some are not. Things get elaborated. We don't know if he actually looks like that little, I have a little statue of him on my, in my, on my bookshelf in my office. I don't know if that's what he looked like. Nobody knows. But that becomes him to us. You know, this painting on the left becomes Jesus to us. And so we tie that in with the teachings were presented from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we say, this is what I must live up to. This is what I must follow. So we don't know if that's true. But we don't question it because we were given that by the authority of the church of, uh, you know, our from day one. As I said, this picture hung in my house all my life. I think my mother still has it. So that's the Jesus most of us grew up with, and we accept things like this, and when we hear or see something else, it's a kind of a shocker. But in my opinion, it's a good thing. It's a good shocker. It's good to make a shift in our perception, our awareness. Is what I think I know true, really true? Is this really what Jesus represented? So I've taken a couple of uh, verses here that I think are um, important. I'm sort of adding to what's on the back of your program. This is not included in there, so we're sort of expanding here. You have that side, and you'll have this as well. But the Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? This is how I pick up tidbits of who Jesus was. You get these things that if... If it was important for Jesus to have a rabbinical education to give him credibility, I think he would have probably either done that or the gospel writers would have 
acknowledged that or, or made it up to say he was trained, you know, by these professionals. But what this tells me is the Jews marveled because they didn't know how he came up with the information or the knowledge that he had. But I totally understand it. He was an intuitive individual who was open to the spiritual principles, the spiritual activity in himself, so much so that he called it Father, he called it Source. This is where I come from. I'm not this body, you know, I'm not this physical being that is walking the planet here with you. I'm not always going to be with you. But they are all looking at, well, if anybody knows anything, they have to go to school. They have to read. They have to study. Otherwise, how could you possibly know anything? And yet the stories go, several stories, and this is another indication to me that Jesus was able to silence the, the lawyers and the, and the Pharisees. If you can silence a lawyer, you got something going for you. <laughs> so where did he get this knowledge? And I can totally get where he got it. Because all of us have, at our core, infinite wisdom, infinite intelligence. God is our source. It's not something we just say. It is absolutely true. We don't say it to make it true, as Jim Freeman would say. We say it because it is true. That God is my source, the source of my being right now. So you say, well, what if I had the wisdom of God? Wouldn't you be the wisest person in the world? You are. But we shut that off because we're operating from a painting of ourselves. It's not true. We're coming from a perspective of ourselves that isn't true. And so the people that were observing Jesus, that were watching him, that were saying, where did this guy get all this wisdom? They were coming from that self-image, that census-based personality that did go to school and did learn things and was using that information as the benchmark for wisdom. And so this guy comes along that doesn't do all that, and yet he is wiser than all of them. How could he possibly have this? They didn't understand that there's a way to turn inside, to turn within rather than turn without, to get this type of knowledge. And that's always been the problem with spiritual things. That's why we have a religious industry that has nothing to do with spirituality. And that's why so many people are rejecting it. It's not about memorizing prayers. It's not about reading Bibles and all the things that we think will spiritually enlighten us. It's about laying all of that down. Jesus said, the letter of the law killeth. It's the spirit that gives us life. And that's another indication that this Man was a mystic. He knew how to draw from that inner fountain. And he knew how to let that teach his intellect. And so it amazed people, and you'll see this today. You know, we, we look at people and we see what kind of background they have, what kind of credentials they have to see whether or not we trust them. But haven't you known PhDs that are just as screwed up as everybody else? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> it doesn't guarantee anything, does it? Because you can tell when a person has it and when they don't. It's not information in your head that that's not what we're after. We're after a fountain bubbling up within our being. This is, this is our source. This is the soul. And if we're out of touch with that, you can get into the religious business. You can be successful at it. You make a lot of money at it. You can drum up a great crowd. But you'll be a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones without that connection, without that awakening. So they didn't understand Jesus. He was coming from 
a place that you and I can come from, and I think that's what he encouraged all his followers to do, is turn your attention from out here to in here and listen and let this deeper dimension begin to unfold itself into your mind. Let it speak to you and you'll see that it is complete. It is, there's not four months to the harvest. It's not something you have to accumulate information on in order to get. It's something that can just open your mind in a flash. The twinkling of an eye, as Paul said, that's what happened to him. On the road to Damascus, he was one person one minute. He had a mind-blowing experience and was a totally different person the next. And it wasn't that he was a different person, it was that he came out. He was able to let himself out. He went from being a Pharisee persecuting Christians to one of the greatest voices representing the Christian movement, the Jesus movement, to have ever lived at that, up to that point. Definitely changed. But nothing in Paul changed. He found a dimension in himself that was there all along. And I think that's kind of what was happening. He was following the, the effects of Jesus. He was going where Jesus had gone and finding followers and trying to snuff all that out. But he was seeing the impact that this man had on people and he probably just woke up one day and this it hit him that there's something I have not seen in myself that he was talking about. And it just opens up, but it's not a time-based process and probably most of us think of it this way. Certainly the people that were raising this question saw it that way because they'd never known of Jesus going to do studies with the rabbis and all the stuff you're supposed to do if you're to get a religious education. We don't want a religious education. We want a spiritual experience because the spiritual experience will give you the religious education or the spiritual education. We don't need a religious education. We don't need to learn about theological formulas that people come up with. It's interesting study, and I'm glad I've exposed myself to it just so I know what others go through, what others are having to overcome. We have a lot of recovering Christians <laughs> in this world. People who have gone down that idealized presentation of who Jesus was and what we're supposed to be and following him and all of the things that we have gotten involved in that have no spiritual value to them. It's a religious industry and it keeps turning this stuff out and I don't know if you know it, but last, yesterday, the world was supposed to end. Do you hear that? A lot of people bought into that. And how many times have we heard that? Some planet's supposed to run into us or something, X, planet X. NASA says does not exist, but people persist. You get into this religious mentality and you drum it up and you start pointing at hurricanes and earthquakes and fires and all of the things and we go down this road. If you look at the book of Revelation, it has nothing to do with today. It has nothing to do with any of the predictions that people keep jumping up and saying. The end is near. Absolutely nothing. Christians were under persecution from the Roman Empire. They were feeding Christians to lions. That was their... <laughs> entertainment. It was a pretty horrific time and the writer of Revelation said this will end soon. You have to have faith. You have to keep hanging in there. Even if you become a martyr, you'll be better off than if you give in. Because Christianity, the followers of Jesus were beginning to collapse. And many scholars think that book saved the Jesus movement it was, as it was known, as it was called then. And then it went into obscurity for many years. And nobody knew Revelation at all. And then it came back into popularity, but completely reconfigured. And now we're looking outside again, trying to predict. 
And the fellow that made this prediction, of course, he's backtracking. He says, well, the world didn't end, but the world as we know it ended, began to end. You can say that any day of the week. <laughs> the world I grew up in and you grew up in doesn't exist anymore. It ended. I don't remember what day that was. <laughs> it's a process. It's an evolution. I didn't know what a computer was when I was little. Now I can't live without it. But the world's always ending. It's always beginning. But what we do is we buy into this religious stuff. You know, God's up there going to give it to us. He's really going to show us. And it has nothing to do with reality. Any more than these predictions have anything to do with reality. Somebody called it fake news. <laughs> it's a good description. I don't know how many times I've heard that. The end is coming and the date. Jehovah's Witnesses are the best at it, I think. They're the best at getting it wrong, and I wish someday they'd wake up and see that, and they never have gotten it right. And if they are right, nobody's going to know it anyway. <laughs> well, I guess 144,000 will know it, whatever, whoever's left. And I don't want to be one of them because they're all going to be Jehovah's Witnesses, and I don't want to do that. So, anyway, I don't know what's getting into me, but maybe I'm mad the world didn't end. It's about time it does, maybe. So here's another... Um, one that I really like, and you know, all, both these are very familiar to you, but it's another indication of uh, there's something else going on here that's not on the surface. You can't judge by appearances, as Jesus had said. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea's Phil Philippi, Philippi, whatever, uh, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And the reincarnation buffs like to use this because um, it's pointing to people that are dead. So how could he be one of them if they're all dead? And they're saying that's proof of reincarnation, proof that people believed in it, and they did. That was not a, an uncommon thought back in his day, but that doesn't matter, that's not the issue. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's the most important question I think he could have posed to them and to us. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And again, if you're Coming from the traditional background, you can easily put God up there and Jesus, you know, here's the only son. But Jesus is saying, Peter, you're seeing something that is not obvious. You're seeing a level of who and what I am from a different perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this. I'm not what I appear to be and neither are you. It's stains like this that um, convince me that he was speaking from a spiritual center. And as I have said many times, if Jesus is to mean anything to us, he has to be one of us. And that's been a debate, you know, for, from day one when, when scholars started asking, is Jesus God or is Jesus man? He's a spiritual being going through a human experience, as Teilhard de Chardin said, of all of us. A spiritual being going through a human experience. If Jesus was some other species, he has no value to us. But if he's one of us, then we listen from a different perspective. What was he talking about? What made him who he is? What gave him the insight? Why did he say these strange things if they have no value or no relevance to me as a spiritual being? What Peter saw in Jesus as the Christ being that spiritual dimension, what I call the soul, he saw he was a spiritual being coming not from the flesh, not from the body as most of us do, but from that spiritual dimension. That's what he is. That's what you and I are. 
I have a body. I'm not my body. And all of the education I have, all of the study I've done, all of the things I've memorized, that's all surface. The thing that has had the most impact on me is touching that spiritual dimension. It's an electrifying moment that changed my life. And it is the very thing that has been my benchmark of thought. This is what I am. And I forget it. I get lost in the physical side of this. All of us do. And that's the challenge of any spiritual teacher. When Buddha became enlightened, he sat under this tree, you know, for seven days or something. He said, I'm not going to leave until... He was on this search. He came from a very wealthy background, as you know. He was 29 years old when he left home. Totally protected from all of the elements of the world. He goes out and he goes through all of these things that teachers told him to do. And one of them was to starve himself. That if you deprive the body, you'll become enlightened. So he deprived his body. He didn't just deprive his body. He did it ten times better than anybody else. <laughs> He lived on one grain of rice per day, according to the story. Said his backbone looked like a string of beads. His whole rib cage was sticking out like rafters in an old house, he said. His eyes were sunken where you could just see the glint like looking into a deep well. In other words, he was almost dead. But he realized that's not the way. He was following these teachers. And a woman walked by one day, according to the story, and offered him some rice porridge. He ate it, became revived, and was able to actually pursue the spiritual path again. And the five friends that he had that were all starving themselves as well, sleeping on nails and doing all the things they were doing, they thought he was a glutton. He went up to five grains of rice a day, I guess, I don't know. But he started eating, he started getting his vitality back, and he realized that there's a middle way. He said it was like a sitar, it has a string. If you lower the string so low, it doesn't make any sound, and if you tighten it too tight, it'll break. You gotta put it in the middle. So that's kind of what we need to do with Jesus. We need to pull him out of this Son of God, big glorious thing that we have made him into. Not demean him, but to put him at the same level we are, or to put ourselves at the same level he is. We're one and the same. We're all human beings expressing on this planet. And if he is going to be of any value to me, he has to be explaining or telling me what is true of me. What is true of him is true of me. And I think he did that. I don't think Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke and John always did it. And certainly the church has not done it. And they've had reasons for not doing it. It's a power play. If you have a, an icon like a Jesus and you know him better because you're the educated one. And everybody else is kind of the, you know, whatever you have to do to get into heaven, tell me what that is and I'll follow. I'll memorize the Bible, I'll do whatever I need to do. You follow this religious prompting. It has nothing to do with the man Jesus. It has nothing to do with what he did or what he expressed. But what I believe he did is he discovered as we all intuitively know that there's a spiritual dimension and that is the real of us. It's not this body. This body's important, but it's temporary. And all the input we get that we bring from the outside in, this is all surface stuff that floats. And we use it in practical ways to get ourselves through daily life and so forth. But we are not that. We are eternal beings. We are spiritual beings. 
And he, I think, recognizes to the point where he would say, the things I do you can do also and greater things because I go to the Father. Why would that be included in someone's sayings that claim to be the only begotten Son of God? It'd be misleading. So I take him at his word, but I don't take the gospel writers always at their word. And you kind of go through this and sort it out. Even the scholars, the, the Jesus seminar that went through and tried to point out sayings they felt were authentic of Jesus and sayings that were probably created by the church, their benchmark would not be the same as mine. My benchmark is my own spiritual experience. And that um, is subjective, so you can't pass it on to anybody else. But it's like, if you've been to a place, say you've been top of Mount Evans, and I've been to the top of Mount Evans, and we talk about that, I'll know that you're telling me the truth. I know you've been there. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice which means that when we have a compatible experience, we understand what we're saying. There's a, a resonance there. And I go more by that with the sayings of Jesus than I do what somebody says is correct or not. And I go from this inner experience. Because that spiritual dimension is the most glorious thing you'll ever experience. It is exactly what he was talking about. It is exactly what he meant by the kingdom of heaven being within. It's within your reach. It's you. It's me. So this to me is the truth about Jesus. And it's so true that we don't even need a Jesus. We don't need that example if we trust ourselves. Why are we dissatisfied with the spiritual knowledge we have now? Why did we rise out of our traditional training and pursue this path? It's because we are following that inner Christ, that soul that has not been revealed to us through flesh and blood. We're responding to that ourselves. But I do not reject Jesus. I see him as a spiritual genius, one who is so tuned in to what I'm after, to what I'm seeking in myself, that I appreciate another human being that passed that, that zone of doubt, of self-doubt, of questioning, that so lived from that awareness of that source that he called it his father. I know that my soul and the infinite sea that it is immersed in is my source. But how often I forget that. I think my career is my source. My marriage is my source. All kinds of things are my source. And every time I do that, I hit the rocks. I go run aground. And then I come back. It's just a thing we do because there's so many distractions. But I see Jesus, I appreciate Jesus now more than I ever have. <laughs>